Hello once again, this is Skip McCauley, Victor Echo 6 Bravo Golf Tango. This show and tell is about one of my most interesting and fun to build projects I have ever done. By today's standard, this is a, what I call old school way of building a power amp for 1296 or 23 centimeters, but I've had all the parts, so it's uh, one way of doing it. Plus, I enjoy building. This all kind of started when I built my first little single tube amp using a 7289 to use for the uplink transmitter for the old AO40 satellite. Uh, this was my first endeavor into so-called microwave frequencies and uh, had a lot of fun. Of course, we all knew what happened to AO40 and it uh, kind of pushed me getting into moon bounce. So I needed more power. There was lots of plans out there for building cavity amplifiers of all shapes and sizes, single tubes, double tubes, four tubes, six tubes. I decided to go with four tubes in each cavity and build two of them to, uh, f to combine together. So many hours and weeks of metal work, hole drilling, it uh, finally started coming together. Then I had to start all over and build a second one. The copper work was uh, challenging, getting the holes lined up and milled out so that uh, the tubes would line up in their sockets later on. The input circuit was really fun to build with its Teflon spacer and then having some kind of a spring-loaded uh, tunable shaft going in for the tuning disc. Then after all that was done, lathing up the cooling water jackets for all eight of the tubes for the two cavity amps. Next on the agenda for this project was building up the chassis to hold the two cavity amps and all the other assorted goodies that go with it. Being faster than most, I had to uh, really get inventive with mechanical linkage so all the knobs on the front panel would line up to where I wanted them to go and make everything fit. The output tuning mechanism got kind of complex because the uh, shaft has to go up and down, not just round and round, so there had to be kind of a slip joint involved with uh, the mechanism. The output section, which is linked through an insulated shaft, is chained over to a turns counter off for the front panel. The tuning of the input section is done the same way with the sliding shaft and uh, worm gear drive. And with all that done, the uh, next section to build up was one of the more interesting parts of the whole project. Like most tube amplifiers, you would like to have a, some kind of a meter to measure your anode current for each tube. Well, with eight tubes in this circuit, or in this project, uh, it's going to be hard to have eight, eight meters on the front panel. What I decided on was to build eight bar graph displays with these uh, square LEDs that I have in my surplus stock to represent the eight individual tube anode circuits. Then I had to build up the metalwork to house everything. This required a faceplate with uh, milled slots for the row of LEDs that fit into to turn this thing into a complete module. The two large circuit boards bolted to this faceplate with spacers and then a custom back was built to make this thing a complete module. All the inputs are fed into it through feed-through capacitors. Now I started hooking up some of the coolant air lines. Uh, the filament uh, circuits were wired into it. And then all the heavy wiring underneath the chassis for all the bias circuits and other associated circuitry. With some paint and some fancy deckling, the RF section was finished. Next came the power supplies, which are PIC controlled. The PIC circuit controls the high voltage startup. It also displays the high voltage on the LCD displays, the status of the filament uh, circuits, and also takes inputs from the main sequencer control shelf, which will shut this down if things go wrong. Things were going good now. I built up a temporary water system for tube cooling. I was able to check uh, one cavity at a time, and uh, all the other circuits were checked out. Things were looking good and ready to go. Now the real wild part of the whole project is built, the main control and sequencing shelf. This shelf contains three individual PIC circuits which, that are all tied together. Uh, the main one is the sequencer board itself. The other two are the temperature control flow control boards for the cavity A amp and the cavity B amp. Basically how this thing works is if there's any condition that's wrong, the sequencer will not let the amplifier go into transmit mode. 
or if, it, if it's already transmitting and something goes wrong, such as the coolant flow was a drop of, below a certain set point, it would shut everything down in a nice sequential order. It um, pretty well takes care of itself all around. There are a number of LEDs on the front panel which go between green and red, which indicate the status of the sequencer going from receive to transmit to transmit to receive. Also, an alarm circuit such as coolant flow and coolant temperature. The two LCD displays tell you the status of the individual circuits, such as uh, water temperature, flow, t flow rate of the coolant, and also this is where you adjust the set points for um, alarms and fan turn on points, etc. etc. The large variac in the center is, is what controls the plate voltage on the single tube amplifier and the transverter. This is what is controlling the drive power to this big amplifier. The rear of the shelf shows the many connections that go out to the other circuits such as the uh, transverter amplifier, the TS2000, and also connections out to the dish to control the preamp relay and, and preamp itself. This is also where the connection to the visual basic display is connected, which we'll uh, cover later. Last but not least, the coolant water system was built up. There was a separate tank for each cavity and I had built up homemade flow meters which I replaced later with some nice commercial Hall effect sensors. There's also four fans on the back with cooling radiators and individual water circuits because this whole thing was being shared with a 13 centimeter water cooled amplifier. So starting on the back side is hard to uh, get everything all in one view. What we're dealing with is the rack in the center. It's the 23 centimeter power amplifier I'll be talking about. In this video clip, this is showing the back side of the water tank system. The uh, ball valves for controlling the flow either to the uh, 23 centimeter amp system or to the 13 centimeter amp system. Plug-ins uh, go to the different pumps and um, other wires connecting to the flow meter sensors, the temperature sensors, etc. Following the water lines over to the rack, we're uh, slowly going by the two power supplies. Each uh, cavity has a separate power supply. You can see the lines going to it. There's a terminal strip on the left is the main 12 volt bus coming into it. You can see the various voltage cables going up from the power supplies to the back of the main amplifier chassis. The uh, two center ones are the high voltage. The yellow ones are uh, 110 volt AC. Other uh, connections for 12 volts, uh, push to talk control and transmit control from the sequencer and etc. This angle of view you can see a little deeper into the amplifier itself. The uh, center box with the heat sink is the input splitter for the signal to go in from the transverter into the inputs of the cavities themselves. There are two vertical meters mounted on the sides of the rack. What they're measuring is the uh, current leakage to the water from the high voltage gives me an indication when it's time to change the distilled water in it. From this little higher angle of view, you can see down inside the amp chassis itself where the two cavities are. The two white blocks on top of them are the common water manifolds for the water returning to the reservoir tanks. Just above these water manifolds is the next shelf is the amp control and sequencer uh, pick circuits with all the associated wires going to different circuits. The uh, chassis above it is the transverter with its single tube amplifier. Above all that, on top of the rack itself, there's another box and that's the actual RF combiner for the output of the amplifier with its uh, isolation relay for the uh, transmit line heading out to the dish itself. Now looking at the front of the racks, the uh, center one is the 23 centimeter amp we're dealing with right now. To work on the amplifier and get access to the uh, cavities and change tubes possibly. The whole chassis is uh, mounted on a set of slides and can be pulled out of the rack quite easily. If required for servicing, the whole amp can be lifted off the slides and moved over to the workbench. Okay, I'm going to try and show you how this thing works with all its new tricks. So, first thing to do is get the two pick controlled power supplies turned on with the two main DC power switches. You'll see the two of them boot up and give you the status of the two supplies at this moment. Next is the main AC power switches. Whoops, and you can see what's happening here. So I'll shut off the main AC power switch and let the power supply reset itself. 
So now I'll go up to the control shelf and turn on the H2O pumps. You can see the status change in the two LC displays. The uh, pulse rate has gone up and it's showing that the coolant flow is now good. So back to the two power supplies and turning on the main AC power switches again. First power supply came on good. The second one comes on good once I get it caught and uh, we're good to go. Next, turning on the two filament circuits for the tubes. The two displays are showing that the filaments are on, so next in the agenda is turning on the high voltage. Activating the high voltage circuit of these two switches is another part of the pick process. The uh, high voltage won't start to come on until there's ample filament warm up time, as indicated by the display. There will be a countdown before it uh, kicks in. Uh, and I'm going to speed this process up. The top power supply for Amplifier Array has won the race and the high voltage will start to come on in a slow process, again being controlled by the pick controller inside the power supply. The lower power supply for Amplifier B has counted down and has started its high voltage power supply startup also. It takes a few seconds for the high voltage display to settle down. Uh, it's quite a step down from 1800 volts DC down to 5 volts DC input for the pick chip itself. Uh, it's usually within plus or minus 30 volts of the actual high voltage. And back to the main control shelf here. It's probably hard to see in this video, but the when the pumps were turned off, the coolant flow LEDs were red, and also the sequence enable LED is flashing. And when everything goes green, the amp is ready to transmit. Looking at the LCD itself, the first line tells you what the uh, water coolant tank temperature is. In this particular display, the transverter water temperature is next. And then the uh, third line is telling you that the coolant flow is good. There's a set point that trips it. And then the bottom line is telling you how many pulses per second the uh, flow meters are indicating. The second part of the display is the uh, set points, which are all adjustable from the front screen. The auto fan on is for the fans at the, on the cooling tank. Uh, the auto fan off, of course, it tells when it's shut down. The uh, H2O LED over temp is for the over temperature LED. And uh, the last one is the flow meter alarm, which is set for 10 pulses per second. If, it, if the flow rate drops below 10, it shuts everything down, it shuts the transmitter off. The third part of the display is pretty self-explanatory. It's giving you the temperature of each individual tube circuit on the water lines. Okay, it's time for some RF output. You'll first hear the seekers are keying in the transmit relays and then you'll see the bottom of the bar graphs light up. This is with the transverter plate voltage set at 400 volts. Now I'm turning up the driver plate voltage to just over 600 volts. Turning the driver output voltage to just over 800 volts. Okay, I'm pushing the limit. Uh, driver output voltage is just around 900 volts. I could go farther, but uh, that's when things get exciting, so uh, <laughs> that's where I'm going to stop. I usually run the amplifier right around 700, 750 watts when I'm working the moon. Next is a real cool part for the bag of tricks for the old school style of uh, amplifier. So this is the first monitoring display of the complete system from the VH exciter all the way through the amplifiers right up to the feed horn of the dish. The system was good to go until I threw the switch on the uh, sequencer switch, went from automatic to manual, and it puts it into alarm mode. Being in alarm, the sequencer is disabled and it won't go into transmit. Next I've shut off the water pumps to simulate a flow problem and you'll see how the uh, amplifiers go into fault mode. Of course, when these faults show up, uh, I don't know what the problem is. It just shows me where in the system it is. 
and then I would go to a different screen to uh, troubleshoot it further. So next is the representation of the system going into transmit and back into receive. You'll see how the signal pathways change and what devices become active. You just switch in the transmit and you can see how their pa signal pathways have changed color, the amplifiers are active, and uh, the load resistor on the preamp relay has switched over. There we switch back to receive mode. And everything looks good. The uh, sequencer status is still good to go. That pretty well covers it for that display, so now it's time to go to the next one. So this screen is showing a meter for each tube in both cavities for looking at the individual anode currents. It's extremely handy for setting up the bias and getting the idling current set. So we'll key the amplifier here and uh, we'll, you'll see the idling current for all the tubes. This monitor being a uh, touch screen is also very handy to use the push to talk button on it for uh, keying the transmitter and uh, go on and tweaking things. So now I'll change the full scale on the meters to 400 milliamps and keep the transmitter and you can see the anode currents uh, increase as I increase the drive power. These meters uh, read accurately enough but you have to remember there's quite a bit of lag time between uh, when these are deflecting and what the actual circuit is doing so it's uh, it's mostly just for diagnostics and, uh, like I say, adjusting the idling current when you, when you have to, say, on a fresh tube or whatever. So that pretty well wraps it up for this screen. Um, time to go to the third and last. This monitor is uh, pretty well the diagnostic screen for the amplifier, coolant system, and temperatures. Again, being a touch screen, I have uh, control over the uh, fans and the pumps in this uh, screen to the amplifier. On this screen also, you can see the individual temperatures for the two water tanks uh, for the separate tubes. The transverter uh, water system has a temperature sensor here also. And on the far right, the ambient air that's blowing out of the cavities is also being monitored. The uh, water lines are right now indicating blue, which means there's a good, good uh, coolant flow. To simulate a flow problem, I just pinched off one of the ball valves from the water tank. You'll notice the water lines have changed from blue to orange, and the pulse rate from the flow meter has dropped down below 10 and turned red. I once again opened the valve and the flow has been restored and everything's back to normal. This is it when it's uh, switched into transmit mode externally. And also I have touch screen control to key the transmitter remotely. So that's about it for that screen. Um, there's too much else to show on it so we'll uh, exit of here and go back to the main screen and uh, that wraps it up. Once again, thanks for looking. 73s from Victor Echo 6, Bravo, Golf Tangle.